Hi guys, today we're here with Kerry Ann Payne, open water swimming legend, uh, Olympic silver medalist, former world champion, three-time Olympian, uh, and we're going to be chatting to her about her career, about training technique, and her swimming going forwards. So what did you enjoy most about competing at that top level, and do you miss it? I do get asked all the time if I miss it, and I miss the friends that I used to have. I miss the training group that I had. I miss seeing my coaches because um, I saw all these people every day, twice a day for years, 10 years, 12 years. So to all of a sudden go from seeing them all the time to pretty much cold turkey was really hard, actually. It was like moving house or country or whatever, just totally missing a whole group of people. So I really miss that. I do not, however, miss getting up at 5 a.m. But having said that, I really loved the training element of the swimming that I used to do. I really loved making myself a better athlete, and that was really why I was swimming. So competing for me was a a way of showing how the training I was doing was improving me as a person, as an athlete. Um, so it was almost like a means to an end as such. I was doing that to prove that the training I was doing was helping me to be better. So I did really, really love training. And when I was doing it, getting up at 5 a.m. was easy because I knew why I was doing it. But now I don't have to get up at 5 a.m. anymore. Um, I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> and why did you choose to focus on 10K events rather than other distances or pool swimming? So the reason I ended up doing open water swimming was it kind of because it, it found me in a way. So I was doing 800s um, and I had a couple of really good junior years coming up the ranks. And then round about 2006, the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, I had a real shocker. It was just a terrible competition. I wasn't enjoying training. I wasn't really enjoying much about swimming at the time. Very close to hanging up my goggles, as they say. Um, and my coach at the time, Sean Kelly, was kind of pulling his hair out because he knew I had talent to do something, but I just didn't have the drive for that in the pool anymore. So there was two options. One was to go to Sheffield and do a 400 medley. The other option was to go to Australia and do a 10K. So <laughs> I kind of picked Australia and went out there. And at the same time is when um, Cassie Patton came to join us at Stockport um, and she was doing 10Ks already. So it made a perfect opportunity for me to try something new. And that was the start of it for me. And then before I knew it, I'd made it to the Beijing Olympics and come, came home with a silver medal. And I was kind of dubbed an open water swimmer from there really, which was interesting because I hadn't ever thought about that being the career path I would have taken. Okay. So when you were swimming at Stockport in the early days, um, what did that training schedule look like and how does that uh, differentiate from like your training that you did, that you did uh, going into Rio and the training that swimmers do nowadays? When I started training for the 10K, it really wasn't too different from the training I was doing for the pool for the 800. So I would say I was doing around about 70,000 meters every single week, which sounds like a lot to someone that doesn't do much swimming. But in the world of swimming, um, I know that loads of other girls and boys that were doing open water swimming were doing 100K plus um, pretty much every single week. Now, for me, that didn't work. Um, and for Cassie as well, to a certain extent, it just didn't work for us because what we had that a lot of the other Muslims didn't was the speed. So we had to make sure that we were doing the distance and we had the stamina to do it, but we also had the speed to have a last, uh, a fast last 2,000 meters essentially. So there was a balance that we were playing and it was quite a fine line. And I'd say for the first, you know, seven or eight years that I did it, it was very much about pool-based swimming doing hard heart rate sets, doing hard um, threshold sets, race pace sets. Um, but what I noticed when I, certainly when I got a bit older and when the world of open water swimming changed, so we were, myself and Cassie and David Davies were the front runners. We were revolutionizing the world of open water swimming because we'd come from the pool and the open water. And through the years, loads more countries started to do that. So then we had the likes of Sharon Rowandell who did the 10k world champion absolutely incredible race won it by a minute and then four days later she went and came second in the 400 freestyle at the world championships and she went of like a 402 or something absolutely outrageous um there's just it's not really it's not possible to compete really there's not many people that can do that so what we saw was that 
we'd started this wave of bringing really fast pool swimmers into the open water and I just knew I wasn't able to do that. So my training had to change, I had to be smarter. So the training I did when I was in Edinburgh was very race specific and it, it had to be. It had to be more around what, how could I closely prepare for my performance as closely as I could in training. So it was, the sessions were slightly different. So one example was on a Friday morning, um, I would do it in four week cycles and I'd start with 9K straight, 10K straight, 11K straight, and then the fourth week was 12K straight, which I initially dreaded, but actually in the end, I knew that it was a really important session for me because it meant that I had total confidence that I could do 10K with no worries. This is a kind of question about the mental side of swimming. So how much did you, time did you spend exploring the mental side of open water swimming and training uh, in your career? And are there any particular kind of like psychological tips that uh, you can share with us that will help? Yeah, so I, I, I genuinely thought that I had um, nailed this in the lead up to London. I really thought that I was totally fine. I had trained the best I had ever had. I would come in being Olympic silver medalist and double world champion. I was the first person to qualify for Team GB. So I thought I'd nailed it and I didn't really need to think about it. And then, um, when I got into it, I realized actually I only nailed it for plan A, which was the plan that I used to follow. I didn't have plan B and plan plan double Z happened while I was in the middle of the 10K, which was I'd gone from leading in the front to being in the middle of the pack to being forced to swim in and around people, which at the time I really wasn't very comfortable with. Um, and I guess one of my first feelings of that was, was anger, but towards myself that I hadn't prepared that. So in that moment when... I went into the feeding station and basically got hit in the face um, purely because I had made a rookie error. Um, I was really frustrated that I hadn't ever planned anything else. So I made a really big thing from London through to, to Rio that I had to make sure that I worked on all the aspects. I had to be okay with certain things. I had to be okay with a moment in the swim where something didn't go my way. How did I deal with that emotionally and how much of my energy did that waste? I guess another example is... Um, it was probably my seventh or eighth race after London that I got back into the water and I had taken some time out and I got back in and I was starting to do some good racing and we went to Hong Kong which is one of my favorite swims to do and I was in the lead we had maybe 150 meters to go and one of the girls pulled my leg back um which nobody saw it's hard to see that um the boat I, and I remember stopping being so angry and going, what are you doing? And I looked at the referee and was like, did you not see that? And I got really upset and wasted so much energy. And what we hadn't noticed was that there was two other girls behind her because she pulled me back, she messed with her stroke and they basically slingshotted whatever the right way is around both of us. And they ended up being first and second. Um, and because there was that little moment and I thought, actually, if I hadn't, if I hadn't have reacted quite as much, I haven't used that much energy and just kept going, maybe I could have done better. But we finished joint third, um, which she wasn't very happy with. But I was happier that we managed to <laughs> finish at least joint third and not, um, not anything else. And looking forward to the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, who are some of the names that we should be keeping an eye on? It's amazing how quickly, when you're not competing week in, week out, month in, month out, you lose the idea of who's there and who's not there. But, um, you know, for me, you've got to keep an eye on the on the ones that almost didn't quite do as well as they hoped a previous cycle. So the French girl, um, Ariel, I think that she's absolutely somebody that we need to be focusing on because she's hungry to do what she didn't do in um, in Rio. So I think that'll be an interesting one. The girls race is always going to be a fascinating one. It depends on the conditions. So I'm excited to see what the conditions are on the day. Um, but I think if it's flat, I think our pool swimmers are going to do well. If it's wavy, you know, you can never rule out the the, the always favourites, the likes of Anna Marcella Kuna. In the men's, um, you know, you've got, again, very similar sort of, you know, we've got Palsarini now starting to take a a step into the open water world that will be interesting to see how he fares in a more competitive not he's very competitive but in a more physically competitive mm -hmm. environment so I'll be interested to see how he competes over the next short while um, and then we've got Jack who you know who's the like didn't do as well in Tokyo and sorry in Rio as he wanted to so you know I would put a lot of my time and, and money on Jack doing a really good job because I know that he's hungry for it and he wants it. So if you want more technique and training advice than Carrie Ann, get a copy of Outdoor Summer every month where she's our regular training and uh, technique writer. 
or head over to straightlineswimming.com, her website for more coaching and teaching information.